everyone, and welcome to Get Celebritized. I'm your host, Araya McGarry, and I'm always excited to bring you new episodes each and every week where we help you earn more so you can live more, live a vivacious, wonderful, big, juicy life, and you can give back more to the people and causes that matter most to you. Now, the gentleman I'm about to introduce you to fits in beautifully with the live a rich, juicy, wonderful, wonderful, like he likes to call himself, a bon, oh, I'm going to get it wrong now, honey, you have to help me, bon vivant, vivant, he's going to help me with that. Anyway, let me introduce you to him. He, Hunt Etheridge is an award-winning dating and relationship expert. He's a TV personality. He's a coach, a matchmaker, a writer, an entrepreneur, a wonderful loving husband and loving father, the Bond by Van. I'll make sure I pronounce that right. And he's an all-around swell guy. He's my friend, and he's also a podcaster. So you know he has my heart there. But let's bring him up here. I probably butchered that word Bond Vivant enough times now. Hunt, get on up here. Hello, Aurea. It is so good to see you again, as always. So good to see you, Hunt. And did I butcher that word? It's a French word. Tell me what that bon vivant. Bon vivant. Yeah, oh, basically, it means a, a good liver. Uh, someone that wants to suck the marrow out of the bones of life. Basically, as you know, and you know, people that like to learn. But the, the more you learn, the more you realize is out there. The more you want to experience. The more you want to try. Um, and really life is a beautiful thing that's out there and we should all experience as much of it as we can you know i have never heard that saying of sucking the bone marrow you know to live the most life that is fabulous and you really are and hunt i brought you on because um as we're filming this we're going into the holidays but this will be an evergreen episode for sure because people are always looking for love and relationships and it's a big huge topic and you have really niched this down to some specialties of yours you're a matchmaker you you also coach people mm -hmm. on finding love and so let me let you introduce yourself what sure. it is that you do because you got a really wonderful niche here yeah sure so i got started in this 16 17 years ago um actually by my therapist i was going to her for various and sundries as we all should especially you men that are listening out there and she said to me, the men that come in here are broken and I can fix them. But the thing that they want the most is to have a woman by their side. And I can't give them that. You know more about this than anybody I've ever met. You need to figure out a way to monetize this. And the minute you do, I'll refer all of my patients to you. So hearing a female psychotherapist have such three resounding pats on the back, uh, that's at least what started the journey. Do I know more? Is it an art? Is it a science? Is it a skill set? Can you teach it? How do you break it down? Is it something you can practice? You know, what things can you focus on, et cetera, et cetera. And as I've been doing it now these past 15 plus years, I've gotten to see when I first started doing this, online dating was still considered taboo. So you can, sit, can see how many trends and things have happened since then that are just trying to help everybody along the way. And you throw a pandemic in there and a couple of recessions and like, it can be challenging. To say the least. Now, again, this is a big, wide topic here and you really do it you do niche it down and and i love that you have a beautiful wonderful wife you got two gorgeous little girls you're such a great dad and husband mm -hmm. so i always tell people take advice from people where you want to be so you've got all the goods and you've decided to niche this down even more than just helping everyone find love so tell us a little bit about some of these niches and who sure. you best like to serve and give advice to yeah absolutely um as you said like i love everybody and i want to help everybody, but you can't necessarily help everybody. Mm -hmm. So there's two, fine, one, one, what am I world-class at specifically? And two, what niches are underserved? That's always a good way to find out if your business idea may have legs. Right. And so um, I started coaching men way back in the day. And while I coach about 50-50 now, I, I'll say I kind of have a special relationship with men because men a lot of times get persnickety sometimes taking advice from women because they feel they're being scolded and not in a spirit of trying to help. And so I can come in and, you know, speak man to man with them and all the, you know, all these phraseologies are fraught with, you know, double meanings and triple meanings. What does it mean to be a man? What is masculinity? You know, of course, we're going to be talking, you know, many times heteronormative behaviors when we know all of the you know, grand expanse of things that are out there. But for the sake of some of these conversations, we have to oversimplify or overgeneralize a, a little yeah. bit, you know, but right now men are going through a crisis. 
And I think a lot of women that are single may understand somehow that they are because of all of these experiences I hear of them dating men. Where are all the good men? Why are, are, are men just so stunted emotionally? Where did this incel phenomenon come from? You know, the, the peoples that are in their basement and never leave home. And so there's a lot going on right now in, in the world of men. And it is not a zero sum game in that take a, focusing on one group does not take away from another group. Last 50 years, we focused on women and done amazing strides. They've crushed it it's far better than we could have ever have hoped to imagine. Unfortunately, a lot of the men have gotten left behind and there's no career paths for those that don't have college degrees. Those that do have college degrees are saddled with an enormous amount of debt that they can't uh, find jobs to repay. And for the first time in hundreds of years, this generation of men will do less good than their parents, which creates an immense amount of shame in a man. And a lot of the markers that we have told uh, men to, is, is being a man, you stable job, you have a car, you own your home. These are out of reach for most people right now in the dating world. And so they're struggling to understand what it is, where do they fit in? What do I provide? Who am I? And what is my purpose in society? And actually right now in college campuses, there's almost a 50% more women on college campuses than there are men. Okay, you know, so one thing that I heard from you, hon, is you were talking about the men. And I think every woman, many times we want to tell if we're in a relationship and they have a guy friend, we want to, and the guy friend may be our friend too. We say the guy, talk some sense into him. Talk, you know, get him to, to see what he's done wrong or the point of view or whatever. It's like you always kind of want that guy friend to talk some sense into them at some point in a relationship, right? Or if it's in a family dynamic, you want the husband to talk to the son. There's always that time necessary where the guy needs to talk to the guy. Yeah. The father needs to talk to the son. And I think that's important because girls, we love that. We love our girl talk, our girlfriend time, our mother-daughter time, you know? So I'm glad you're honing into this. And I didn't even think about the challenges of our new age of, you know, them needing to be even more successful, one to keep up with women that are probably moving forward faster as well. Yep. And with the times that are changing and jobs, you know, changing. Do you also see though, that in this changing times, the, the men and women have even more chance to be successful as an entrepreneur in social media and technology that even though they might not have the same mainstream jobs, their parents and grandparents did, they have a whole new world to conquer. Absolutely. Very well then look at the Ubers and the Lyfts and the, you know, the door dashes and the AI industry. I mean, if they can tap in, then they can Absolutely. Probably Absolutely. And for the most part, it's most women even are okay with dating someone that doesn't necessarily make as much as them. Yeah. But a lot of the times it's the men bringing their own outdated value systems or, or uh affects their emotions in a different way because if a man doesn't feel set about who he is in himself, he may feel emasculated unknowingly and not trying to feel that way. But if he's been told by his old school father that the role of the man is the provider and he doesn't feel he's providing, then in his head, he doesn't feel that he's a man. And I think it goes both ways too, because women, we're still at that generation. No, I'm older than you, but our generation, but your generation is probably still feeling we got another generation to go before that kind of lifts. Because even as women, we still think that if I'm not taking care of the home, even though we're not in the 50s, Susie, homemaker, barefoot and pregnant, but there's still that we still feel like we have to clean the house and take care of the food and the laundry, do all that too. And if we don't, then oh, we're not doing our job as women. And that's mm -hmm. still stuck in our head at my generation, maybe your generation. Now, my daughter's generation, the 18 year olds, they're, I don't think they're going to be set in that way at all because you know, no. they've grown up with me, work, you know, my generation working full time, doing it all. And I think they'll hire more help than we did because we still feel like we have to do it. We have to, you know, iron them yeah. to the sheets still, you know? Yeah. Well, and and it's, it's because it's admitting help. defeat. It's like, no, 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 no. It's time. It's cost benefit analysis. Sit down and like, I had to learn when I was in entering my relationship with my wife, I had more free time. Thus, it was easier for me to do more housework. Yeah. Housework is for yeah. the person that has more time. And then you divide up the things and figure out like, what do you hate less? What do I hate less? We both hate dishes. Great. We buy a dishwasher. It's cheaper than therapy. So there we go. 
And also, I feel like if people, and I, you know, I think I've told this before, but for a short time, just like two years back in the day, I was a matchmaker in between when I escaped domestic violence before I got mm -hmm. married again. And what I learned is if in relationships, if you go into marriage or go into, you know, living with someone, don't think, you know, that male, female role, think of roommates. Mm -hmm. if there, mm -hmm. do it. If you have to be passing by the laundry, you have a minute. Who cares if it's the male or the female throwing the load in and taking the load out? If you see this, just like with your kids, if, it's harder to train them. But if you yeah. see the dishes, you know, can you unload the dishwasher? Because we're living together. And mm -hmm. I think we leave from being roommates and going to marriage. Like, okay, your man job, your woman job. Again, I don't think the, the younger generation will have it as bad as we do set yeah. it those ways. But when this comes to dating, how do you overcome some of this? So now talk to us about the dating relationships and how we bring all of our baggage to oh, yeah. this to find love. And is there a special age you like to work with? Are you working with people in their first love, like 20s men, guys that are 20s and 30s? Or do you like to work with people that are maybe widowed or divorced? They have kids and they're trying to find love again with more life baggage going on. Well, Lorraine, I'm glad you asked me that message. Okay. Um, when I first started doing this, it was primarily men. It was primarily men in their early 40s, late 30s that felt I was their last ditch effort in finding love. So they'd never um, been married before. Okay, yeah, most of them never been married. They're geeky or nerdy of some sort or, 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 or neuroatypical and have never been able to. They've tried everything and nothing works for them. Now and nowadays, which is great, is I'm seeing a lot more people in their 20s because they look at it completely differently. Mm -hmm. Simplifying back in the day, my message used to be, You're broken and I can fix you. <laughs> nowadays, it's more, You've got all these pistons firing. Why not spend a little time and make sure this piston is firing just as much as they're all firing? So I have these people that are coming in, men and women in their 20s, realizing, like, Hey, I realized I missed this class. I don't want to go further in my life not knowing anything about that. Let's fix this. Is there know? a really popular topic, that class, that most people come to you and they've missed that that piece, that message? Here's the thing in the next generation. So, so we've got some old school, like, you know, people in our generation, like we've taught, are trying to teach the men about gender roles or the lack thereof, or basically not to be chauvinist pigs, basically in the simplest pattern. Next generation has got that, you know, but this next generation has been taught to be good men. Great, perfect. But now everyone says they're so nice, but there was no connection. There was no spark because many men don't understand the nuances of emotional intelligence of interacting with men and women. And when Me Too came out, a lot of men got scared and that they felt that if they touched a woman, that they could get slapped and arrested because they don't understand how this works. And the fear of that basically, one, removed some people completely from the dating pool. I don't, I don't want to risk it. I'm just going to go to my basement and hibernate mm -hmm. for the rest of my life. The yeah. other side of it is now terrified to be seen as a creep, to be seen as a predator. And so we'll do all, everything to not be seen that way. And so then you will have someone that's sitting across from you at the table and say, just like a, 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 a naive uh, virgin Boy Scout, like, that's wonderful. And what did you learn about that? Tell me your feelings. Ooh. And have that kind of conversation and then nothing ever goes anywhere because so basically what I'm hearing from my women is that I liked him, but there was no spark. And what I'm hearing mm -hmm. from my men is I don't know how to basically the word they use is escalate. Yeah. How do I, because so, to be in a relationship, you want to be a good man, but you also have to be a sexual creature at this. And you can be both, but you have, they both have to exist. Right. And right. so I'm finding trouble of my men learning how to be sexual, let them know that, I am interested sexually in you without crossing a line. And I think it'd be, tell me, uh, the Me Too movement and that being in the workplace is different than if you're on a date. So if you're in the workplace, you know, you don't want the men touching you and, and all of that. So I can see, you know, that's a completely different protocol. Then if you're on a date, so talk to us about the dating. So they're on a date, are they still, because I haven't been in the dating world for like 
almost 30 years now, do they feel still like they can, if you have that sexual attraction and you're on a date and we'll go into how they find those dates in a minute, mm. but you're on it. Now you're not in the workplace. You're not their boss. They're not your boss. There's none of that. Is there, are they still finding that fear to, you know, maybe hold a hand or make a, you know, any Absolutely. kind of a dance? So tell me a little bit about how it is these days. Yeah. Be, well, well, there's, there's two things to play. There's the man and the woman. Um, so right now, many women are more successful than men. Great, wonderful, and awesome. Unfortunately, men, many women have realized that if you show vulnerability in the workplace, it can be considered a weakness, and which is wrong, but I get it, and it's there, and it exists. So they cover up any sort of vulnerability. So the average man sees this awesome woman and doesn't see any space for himself. Oh, she's perfect. She's got it all together. She's not, she's no vulnerability. Oh, everybody's perfect. <laughs> yes, exactly. Because, you know, and you've, you've got that persona showing your, your strength in the business world and it can't, and a man doesn't see how he can fit in. And especially if he doesn't make as much money as her, then like, well, then how could I possibly, you know, get in there for that? Why too? would you, it's that old adage. Why would she be interested in me? Thinking that all women are interested in is a man's job and his position. And, his and they're not. At all, at all. But we as men are trying to navigate this this emotional um, reality as well, too. And then the other side of it is we, again, general men, um, we've been taught adages that don't really work too. happy wife, happy life. Right. We like but that means to the detriment of one's own self. Yeah. And that's not sustainable. So and then you've got the media. I have a generation of women that are waiting for their Disney prince singing someday my prince will come. I do have to do no work on my behalf and a perfect time will come and swoop me up. Right. And then on the other side, I have a bunch of men that think running through the airport or having a dozen, uh, 12 dozen roses delivered or showing up on your doorstep with, with placards and note cards is the best way of showing your love. And in reality, that would get you arrested. But these, <laughs> this is what our media is telling our men works. And so, or, or you've got, um, this gets, again, the nuance gets difficult because you have someone that like, while all cons things need to have that consent, if you are on a date as a man and you say, may I hold your hand? May I touch your back? May I kiss you? May I touch your breast? It's going to kill everything. Yeah. And so, but again, men aren't told how to figure that out necessarily they're just told like be confident how you know like make sure everybody gets consent like well if you're not asking it specifically that would kill the mood but if you can't kill the mood how do i know that that and then that gets then you, go to basement, you don't get ever seen again you say too much work for me yep they say too much work i'm out or i'm just gonna go with someone lesser because again what i hear a lot from mm. i say i try and again to simplify things, I will have a client say that is a 10 or a nine, you know, and she is confused because all her friends that are sixes and sevens are married and, and, and taken. And she doesn't understand, assuming that they're all good people and, you know, decent, like, why are they finding happiness? And I am not. It's because the men may look at the most successful and figure that's the most chance of getting rejected and they don't want to get rejected. So they want to go for something where they feel has a less chance of them getting hurt. And so they'll go for something lesser. Yeah, someone lesser. And a lesser position. Nobody's a lesser. I, and I get you're totally simplifying. But that lesser, that lesser risk factor, it's kind of like going for the job. Do you go for the big job, the one that you know, you're going to get? Yes. This? Life you know, is all about risk versus reward. Exactly. And really, all that's a big facade. There is nobody lesser or more. No, no. In your head. Yep. You could have the one who's making the millions, who's what you feel is your perfect 10, just as much as you could say, well, I don't deserve that, whatever that yep. may be. And they go for something. Well, let me go over here. Both are just as wonderful and, and beautiful in their own right. It's just what you're thinking you can go for. And if that's what you want or who you want or, the you know, go for it. That's the job you want. Go for it. All you can it better to be rejected than never have tried. You know, See, that's that I do better just to get the no than never try. I mean, I wouldn't have an Emmy on my shelf if I didn't just. I, I believe that. I believe that. I believe that. But the men do not. For the most part, what do you do? for instance, I will take, so one of the things I do is I take men and women out into the real world to practice right. talking to real people, not right. necessarily to meet women or to meet men, 
have to go out and practice. Let me tell stories. Let me answer, ask good questions. Let me answer questions. Let me, you know, take, take up space, practice things like that as well too. Um, Where do you take them? To parties or bars or restaurants? Um, I usually find like events, like networking events or cool fun, thing, like white parties or a Moe Chandon um, thing or the New York City's best uh, croissant like I'm finales and just oh guys that meeting capital of the world oh it's so much <laughs> fun there's, there's the so much fun is rough yeah but yeah. i would say let's say when i bring a, a guy out and he'd go up to talk to four people and it doesn't go the way he wants it to and he talks to the fifth person and it does gets a phone number say so he he's what he, four losses one win win ratio of 20 percent okay but he had to walk through four pain points to get there and again not real pain because it's only in your head but for the sake of ease four pain points to get there. But I found the men would rather go home, get on their computer, send out a hundred emails and get one yes for a win ratio of 1%, but not have to go through any pain points to get there. And women because, don't, how are the women with it? Well, the women are getting deluged with uh, stuff online. Yet if they go out, out in the real world, there's not a, a lot of guys out there because the yeah. men have like withdrawn. And so, then I have the female the clients that come to me and they're like, where are all the men? Yeah. Like, how do I find the men? You know? I'm never going to find somebody in an email. I can see them going to social media or a dating app or something, but email, who's opening up the email and finding, you know, Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright or something, you know? <laughs> it's, it's, I think that with the advent of so much social media that people are looking at that as the primary way to meet people. And I get it. I understand it's time. It saves time. But only 20, for instance, like only 20% of the information that we give to each other are the words that we're using. The rest is our tonality, our body language, you know, the stuff that our pheromones, you know, the, the things in person. And so we sit here sometimes with this computer screen in front of us connecting. And that's great. It's better than not connecting. But we're still missing out on so much of the actual human connection. Hunt, you just said something. I mean, I just had this. Oh, again, I have not. Uh, experienced the online app dating because I was when I was a matchmaker it was in the '90s. It was video dating, seeing people in person, then coming into the into the office oh, yeah. that type of stuff. So you just said something that I think is critical. You said even though, well, for one thing, they, people can lie on their profiles, and you're looking yeah. at an app. But you said something really interesting that you're not getting the inflection of their voices. I mean, you can see a video, maybe I don't know if they have videos on there, but you're not seeing the chemistry, you're not getting the body language, not getting the inflection. You're just seeing picture, maybe video, and a lot of words that may or may not be true. Mm -hmm. So tell us then what your your thoughts are on the dating apps and whatever those are, how best people can get out there. Let's say today they're watching the show and they just want to start getting out there and having a potential meeting some people, whether it's male or female. Give us some of that advice for them. Give them some hope. Sure. Well, one of the things I ask all of my clients when I first start meeting with them is what is dating supposed to be? Not what is it, but what is it supposed to be? And I hear a lot of, oh, it's a way for people to get to know each other and find out if they're right for marriage or not marriage. Ah, uh, fun. Fun. Dating is supposed to be fun. I understand that it is not sometimes can feel like a second job online going out to make sure I see enough people and send all the emails back. And it can be tough on the ego. If you've got your ego attached to the outcomes and it can feel like time consuming and so much money and I get it. But at the end of the day, we have to remind ourselves that it is supposed to be fun. And yes, while it's important to try new things, go new places, say yes to new opportunities, it's also important to reconnect with fun because what happens to your body language when you're having fun? Gets more relaxed. Get more relaxed. Your eyes sparkle. You smile. Yeah. You start to talk. To I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you just your energy rises. You you you. This is the best version of you. This is the version you want other people to see. And so I think it's important for each. Fun is not frivolous. Frivolity is frivolous, but fun is not. I want to be with someone that I have fun being with. And so I tell all the people, yes, do you, I mean, the apps are going to make you sadder. That's what mm -hmm. they do. I really? have all of the data. Um, Why? Why? What is it? Because I don't know anything about them. All right. So basically, um, all right. So the apps are set up because they don't necessarily want you to win. Because if they were really good at their job, they would lose your money right off the bat. Oh, if yeah. they were really bad at their job, 
you wouldn't have a good experience on it and you would leave. So they strive to have a middling experience so that you stay on it for about three months, you get tired of it, then you go on to another company owned by the same company. And so uh -huh. I do have to caution everybody out there. The point of dating apps is to extract wealth. You can use it as a tool. That's fine. It is a great tool if you're using it correctly. Just understand their goal is not to get you together. It is to extract wealth. Wow. Now, that being said, there's a lot of statistics that go into it. For instance, like the top 30% of men get 70% of the attention because it can be an image-based thing. As a, as, and again, we get what we ask for which is almost never what we need. And so understanding what you want and what you need is basically the dichotomy of human nature right there. Yeah. Um, and so again, most people, for instance, check that college box. We're in New York City. Right now, there are five women to every three men. So that becomes a buyer's and seller's market. However, there's a big asterisk there because that's only with college education. If there was not college education, it's 50-50 here in New York City. But again, when you're looking at something that you ask for, you click that box, college education, why wouldn't I? But if you were out doing something fun and this man with a barrel chest came up to you and was like, excuse me, I need to get by here and picked you up and just gently moved you somewhere and he had hands the size of baseball mitts and it made electricity run up your body when he touched you, it's not going to matter that he's a small business owner or he's a carpenter or he's a little league coach. What's going to matter is you've got a connection with him and you like the way his touch felt on you. You'll figure the rest out. Yeah. But we we seclude ourselves away from a lot of those human interactions, opening ourselves to those things again too, at the sake of, of a lot of the socials. And so- So true. And, yeah. And even with the, with the COVID that happened too, so much of our social muscles got stunted a bit and mm -hmm. that, you know, our, our habits, we are out less, there are less activities. We may desire to be out less because we had to train ourselves to be in. So, you know, and there's a lot of funky yeah. things that are going on in, in human nature and, and behavioral sciences. It really is. And I remember when I was a matchmaker uh, and this again was back in the nineties. So hopefully you can tell me if it's changed, but I remember the women we were talking about that box, that box for college. Mm -hmm. All they cared about then, I don't know about now, was they wanted, um, they wanted, what does he do for a living? What's his job? They wanted to know what his job was. The men, one of the pet peeves they had was they didn't want to date a woman with children, but they'd be looking for a woman in her 30s to 40s. And I said, to find a woman in their 30s that doesn't already have children and some baggage, even if they're the perfect fit for them, they're like, no, I don't want anybody else's kids. It was so hard to get them through that. So has that changed, hopefully? That has changed, but okay. we have our own new things too, oh, as well too. Like, for instance, I have my women say that my man has to earn more than me. Back to okay. that again. And um, okay, so here in the United States, the last year that more men graduated college than women was 1982. And the gap is getting larger and larger every year. It's especially large for advanced degrees and especially large for people of color. So I tell my women, like, there's no up anymore. You are the up. And <laughs> if there is someone above you, he's married, he's a type A asshole. He's gay or all of the above. He doesn't want you. But this is something. So there's something called heteronormative behavior. Heteronormative behavior is dressing your, your girl in pink, dressing your boy in blue. So women have been crushing the heteronormative behaviors of the glass ceiling, becoming bosses and entrepreneurs and VPs and business owners and all those things. But, and again, overgeneralizing, adamantly refuse to let go of the heteronormative behavior of dating up. So and this is where my challenge lies with my women. Wow, that is that is really interesting too. And I know we're we're dealing with this heterosexual dating at the moment. There, there's a whole sc whole scope of all sorts of different, mm -hmm. you know, oh, yeah. um, communities all dating and all. And I don't know how you do all this, but finding love is so special and so important. And just feeling good about yourself and mm -hmm. not in the basement. Just get out and having fun. Make friends. Make friends with the same. That's sex. important too. That's yes. so important. 
older, younger, who cares what they do for a living? If we can get all of that, all of us, whoever you want to date, male, female, same sex, other sex, just, just whatever it is. And get back to that word you just said, have fun and let mm -hmm. the sparks fly. Because you made that great analogy a moment ago about the man touching the woman, even if he didn't pick her up and put her over there, even if he just touched her and excuse me, and you feel something. Oh, yeah. You're not going to, oh, wait, let me get my list. Okay. Um, and check Exactly, exactly. Um, it's, oh. It frustrates me. So basically, mm -hmm. um, dating is a mix of biology, sociology, psychology, and anthropology. By definition, basically, so is everything we do because they're basically the four tenets of humanity. We should all be single. It's, just, it's a lot of work. No. I know, I know, I know. But we have, like, for instance, we've decided that this, the dating interview sitting across from each other, across a table, somehow is the best way to get to know each other. And mm. it's not. We oh. want to set, as the dater, we want to set the stage for chemistry to find us. Okay. This isn't the way. What is? Socrates says, I can learn more about a man in, a life, in, a, in an hour of play than in a lifetime of conversation. So you, okay. you, everyone, one needs to get out. Because if I'm sitting across from you at a table and I say, do you want kids? I'm going to get a stock answer. Maybe mm. a real answer, maybe a not answer, but it's a prepared answer. That for all of these questions, we think we're going through the dating interview asking these. Instead, I want to be out somewhere. Like when I was single, I was uh, I like to play pool. So I like to bring my dates to play pool because I want to see how you deal with winning. I want to see how you deal with losing. I want to see how you deal with competition. I want to see how you deal with ball busting. I want to see how you interact with strangers. I want to see how you interact with the bar staff. I, how you hold I can, your liquor. No. How you hold your liquor. <laughs> and I can come up behind you and you know show you how to shoot a combo. But it, it allows chemistry uh -huh. to find its way in. And with balls and holes and sticks and racks, it gives me jokes and opportunities to have a little playful <laughs> fun if the situation presents itself as well too. But That's I think right. so many of us sit down on that first date and we think that it's an audition for marriage. Seriously, yes. I mean, you have to think that everything as we j just checked, right? If you just go, when I was dating after I left the domestic violence abuse situation, I just wanted to go out and have fun and feel beautiful again. I just wanted to make friends. Um, and I went out just with that, like you said, that fun. That's all I, I gave. I didn't want to be screamed at anymore. I didn't want to be cursed at. I just want to get back out of the house. And with that attitude is how, you know, um, I met my husband and I met other people and I was able to just let go more yeah. and not think of this as an audition every time you walk out the door. Yes. Well, that's what? the biggest mental switch that I try to get with all of my clients is that the goal is not to get a man. The goal is not to get a woman. The goal is not to get married. If you have a goal, you're putting it above you on a pedestal. And if you're putting your man or your woman on a pedestal, it's not as healthy. Mm -hmm. Instead, the goal is to become the type of person that draws people to you. Because even if we see something that we like, if we, 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 we want to go after it, it can be seen as chasing or desperate or needy, even if it isn't, but it's about the perception of it. Well, instead, if you become this person that is having fun, I'm going to look at you and go, that person looks fun. I want to know more about them. Yes. So you're drawn into the person. But a lot of people want just a couple of things to memorize. They don't want to do inner work. They just, yeah. you know... And another thing, yeah, another thing I look for, like when you come out of, and we've, I mean, many of us that are, you could say they've come out of some kind of bad relationship at one point or another in your life, right? Whether mm. you're dating in high school, whatever, there's always somebody, you always, everybody's had a bad breakup, or whatever it takes. Yeah. And I remember when I left, I knew more what I didn't want in somebody than I wanted. I knew I wanted somebody that did, was kind to others that didn't have a temper. And you, so you'll you love this because you're saying all the right things when you're dating, you're going through the checklist. When you're dating, that other person is on their best behavior. Yep. To you. So I watched how when I started dating again, I was like in my third, like 31, 32, single mom. My daughter was like five at the time. And I knew I was one of those that men didn't want to date women with kids. I didn't care. I was going out to have fun and meet, meet people. And I watched how they treated our server, our hostess, people around us. And there was times I was on a date and they never got a second date because they were rude to somebody else. Mm -hmm. You could be happy to me all day long because I know what you want from me. You know, because yep. I'm smart. And they'd be rude to somebody as a rude to a waitress or really persnickety sending food back and just like for not good reasons, just like treating everybody else like lesser than them. And mm -hmm. those are the things I watch. So I'm looking for somebody that loves other people, yeah. that is nice to their family, that's nice to people around them, because that'll be me if we go any further yeah. in the future. That's the thing. I think that so many people in the dating world are hung up on interests 
as opposed to values. Ooh, and that, good. you know, because, uh, uh, you know, they say opposites attract, that's fine in interest because I want to know about your thing and you can teach me about that and I can teach you about my thing. That's great. Opposite values don't attract. And I think that there's two, one, most people don't know what their own value system is because it's, they haven't really had a, a need to sit down and define it to themselves. Most people don't know themselves very well, but then it's how do I showcase my values so that I can draw people in that share the same values. And I think, yeah, at the beginning of relationships, so many people are just trying to do interests and keep their best, you know, their, their best foot forward and, and be on their best behavior. And then that six to 18 months time comes and the, the curtain starts dropping. And then you're like, oh no, no, this is, this isn't what I signed up for. <laughs> Tell me true or false on this. Um, um, I've always asked, told my daughters, I have two daughters and one is married and one's only 18. And I say, watch how the guy treats their mother. Cause eventually that's the way they'll treat you. Is that true or false? Yeah. Yeah. For, for the most part, we're assuming a sane mother. Okay. Yeah, that's which, true. which is its own assumption. <laughs> yes. Right. But how for he most- talks about his mother can, is, mm-hmm. is, is indicative. Yes. As well too. You know, the same, one of the things I, I also instruct my clients, if you want to know about something, if you ask directly, again, you're going to get the stock answer. If I want to find out if you have a good relationship with your family, if I say, do you have a good relationship with your family? I'm going to get whatever your stock answer is. Instead, if I start asking you like, what were holidays like for you as a kid? And I listen. Oh, so my mom and me used to bake three dozen cookies for the mailman every year. Oh, okay. Or I hear, oh, my grandma would take me up and down the apartment building. I say, okay. And I say, what, um, what would you, after you paid your bills, what would you do after you won the lottery? Oh, I'd get a, uh, two seater sports car and cruise down route 66. Okay. I don't think he's looking for a family, but if they say, oh, well, you know, I've got a whole bunch of cousins and I'd really love to pay off their school loans. So they're not saddled with debt as they grow up. It's like, oh, this person is concerned about family. So there's always ways to find out the information that you want to know without coming Mm -hmm. to it head on. And you'll be so surprised how much information people will give you without even realizing that they're giving it to you along this way. This is a perfect segue as we kind of wind up the conversation now, how people are probably leaning in. Okay. You just said some really good juicy things for people to kind of lean in more, be a better listener. Like we are a show host. We're listening. We're asking questions. Same thing. So the stock answer. So give us some advice, how people I'm putting up your website, your Instagram, your Thank YouTube, you. all that is great. So tell us about what you do to help others, how you can, how they can tap into you and what's coming sure. up. Do you do workshops for this? Do you have oh, yeah. master classes? Talk to us a little about how they can lean into you. Should this be something they need more help with? Absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, with all of the, if for the first part, just go to my site, uh, huntforadvice.com or just Google my name. I've been doing this for 15 years and I've got a rather unique name. So I own about the first six pages of Google, but I'll have, I, you know, I have lots of videos and advice out there because there's, there's, I am happy that I've had a chance to focus on different things at different times over the course of my career so I can help people with this too. Um, and so I'm always trying to reach as many people as possible. So uh, one of the things I do is work individually with clients. Um, I also work with almost all of the top matchmaking firms across the world, helping with their clients. Um, I and as well. What's that? Are you a consultant for the matchmaking companies? Yes. Yep. I am. There really? are, there's really only one of me and me being someone that's been in the industry as long as I have that isn't tainted with misogyny from the pickup artist community. And, you know, I, like you said, I'm married with kids, so I have a bit of proof of concept. And so because of that, I coach almost all of the clients of all of the, uh, the big matchmaking firms. Because again, too, sometimes women can get weird taking advice from other women. But if I come in there and I say exactly the same thing, it can, it can be heard differently. And at the end of the day, we just want the best for our clients. Um, so go to my YouTube channel. Um, I've got lots of fun things going on there. I've got a podcast that's going on as well, too. What's I the will name be, of your podcast? What's the name of your podcast? Hunt for Relationship Science. I, meet, I love um, studies and research. And so I've always got a couple of studies. This particular one right here, I haven't read it yet, but Happiness Inducing Behaviors in Everyday Life an empirical assessment of the how of happiness. Oh. And then I read it and I invite the the authors of the studies 
uh, and the scientists to come on and talk about one, what does the science mean? What, a, what does this all mean? And then what does this mean to me? What does this mean to the every man that's listening out there? Why do I need, what, what information should I now have and impart going forward? Because really the goal is to help as many people as possible across as many uh, spectrums as possible as well too, because, you know, we all have experience in this one way or another, and even no experience in dating is experience in dating. And so right. my goal, even my tagline, changing the world one smile at a time. I'm just here to help everybody get a little bit more happy. I love that. Huh? That's so good. And, you know, you got a big job, you know, out there for you, for sure. Do you do any kind of like re men's retreats or workshops or boot camps or anything people can tap into? Like uh, they want to, you know, even get more from you, maybe more group setting because you know, they might be. I need to. I, I, I am transitioning. And so I'm working with some um, new uh, mentees and some new mentors in developing um, more uh, coaching programs that I can start to offer um, for small bits and go to, and I'm in some talks with some men's retreats people to try to open that up uh, and, and get to that right now. I've always kind of set myself up as a business to business, B2B type folk. I go to the businesses and say, here's how I can help all of your clients. Uh, I can win over one person and then I get access to all their clients. So I haven't set myself up an effective business to B to C funnel. Um, that's what I'm working on, you know, over the next year or so is just kind of be putting some more stuff together to make it a little bit easier. So I am more accessible to everyone as opposed to kind of someone that's just behind the scenes working on things. Absolutely. And tell us a little bit about, we still have a little bit more time for you. Uh, what you do with the, what's it called? Metsa? Oh, Mensa. Mensa. Yes. So, uh, so there's a, uh, organization called Mensa, which is basically, um, basically a club for high IQ people. And I was lucky enough to do really good on a test one day. So I was able to join Mensa. Um, but what I found is that people that have high IQs or people that are neuro atypical or people that are both or see the world a different way, or people that want somebody that can be this way. It's a unique set of challenges for people. So I wanted to be able to help address with that. So I'm gonna be working on expanding my Mensa matchmaking um, so that I can offer a resource for that. So we, it's each little niche has its own quirks to it. And so as I am the only matchmaker that's a member of Mensa, I figured I could focus a bit on that as well too. So that I can, um, yeah, give, uh, give. I can, I consider myself a dork. So I can give myself, you know, our fellow dorks and geeks and nerds, just a little bit more help from someone that totally gets it. Well, you're doing the right thing finding niches because you know there's quirks and perks in every niche, you know, and we all have our quirks, and it doesn't matter who you are, whether it's high IQ, low IQ, middle IQ, it doesn't matter. And when people are that, and they can serve that part of the community that's what it's all about whatever it is and um i always think and i was saying this before i think of the big bang theory because you know i love yep. tv i relate everything to television and sheldon on the big bang theory you know there's a match for everyone because you know, he finds a match in there yeah in that he finds somebody of equal kind of um you know brain set that somebody neuroscience is see as well but you're also saying there's some people that may not be that but really would relate to that type of thought process because sometimes you put two people exactly like two magnets are going to repel mm -hmm. of the same thing because yeah. it's too alike to each other sometimes well all the time but you what you really need to focus on is complementary people mm -hmm. complementary skills and so you may have a highly driven type a slightly neuroatypical person that thinks that I need to find someone like me to get me when in fact you don't necessarily, you just need someone that fits in, in fit like, like jigsaw puzzle that fits in your yeah. negative spaces and you help them and they help you. And now you as an entity can move forward better than both of you on your own. Especially somebody that, that loves knowledge, that may not be that neuroscience, but loves the knowledge, loves yep. learning. And they're fascinated by that because that's yep. not how their mind thinks, but they, they want that part of the world in their life. Yeah. You know, somebody, like students that are hungry for knowledge and are constantly in school and learning, that type of person would, may love right. that. You had, a, you had a dad that was a teacher, you know, and you just always loved, you know, just that relationship of asking questions and learning about things new every day. Yeah. And there's it's, things it's, they can teach the other person. So I love exactly. that. Exactly. 
And what, I'm, what I've never really um, experienced with Farhan that you're so good at is when I was in the matchmaking world and dating the whole nine yards, I've never really spoken to somebody like yourself that really takes it to another level. You really have the science of this. You're very well educated and and you research. And who would ever think, you get all these matchmakers stuff that, you know, let's find love. You want somebody tall, dark and handsome. You want somebody blonde. You know, it's all that stuff. You really have taken this to this science level of it where, I mean, even just by teaching us those ways to ask the questions to really find out the yeah. truth there's a science to that that took some education that took some brilliance on your end say don't just say hey do you want to have kids when you go on a date it's let's talk about some other ways you can really get to know somebody faster yes, and better absolutely and so, i think that that paradigm is changing too and i think that yeah. it's getting better <laughs> now do you all right if you with your clients do you yeah. help them i say i know you're saying you to update them out. do you have any kind of socials or times when you bring your single clients together to meet do you match make it all i um i do we'll, we'll put them together i think you should check out this person check out this person but it's more like oh okay if i have a client that i think is doing great i reach out to all of my matchmaking friends and say hey i've got an awesome guy i've got an awesome woman for you any of you looking for someone that fits did, 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 did. and chances are someone is, is looking for something like that. And they're happy because this person has learned is on a self betterment improvement. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, every time I have someone that I work with, I'm trying to figure out who I can set them up with as well too, because, you know, at the end of the day, that's, that's the goal. You want to get people primed and ready so that they can help, you know, set th set, step through that door. I love it. All right, as we close up, we only got about 10 minutes left. Uh, I'm gonna ask you a fun TV question. I normally do not watch the show because I'm not into all the drama stuff because of course my generation, I don't wanna watch all the, the young dating, all the stuff, right? When I was younger, sure. But now it has captured my generation hmm. with the new Golden Bachelor. Oh yeah. Where I'm not about it, but it's, uh, it's so different and it's this older gentleman who's so in love with his wife and now he's a widow and they're bringing in all these these older women. Nobody's, none of the women are under 60. So it's a whole different dynamic. And you're, I can't help but rooting for all of them because you're seeing these people as our moms, as my age now, that wow, to find love after 30 years with the love of your life. And so many of them, some of the women are coming with that same thing. They haven't dated in eight years because they lost the love of their life and they were married for 25. It's this whole beautiful dynamic and you just want them all to find love. Yes. So what are your thoughts? Have you seen it? What's your thoughts on people trying to find love after 60 when they've been through the love of their life and now that's gone? Oh, it's, it. yeah. It, I haven't actually watched the show yet. I'm same you as you. I haven't. I, uh, Hulu right now. Go I on. know, I know, but yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I, I'm happy with it and familiar with it because of that. We get a lot of women, specifically in their 60s and 70s, coming to us looking for love, and unfortunately, statistically speaking, there just aren't as many men alive at that point. So that becomes its own data point, and then you run across the differences in what um, wants one wants for the future. Again, overgeneralizing a little bit. Right, right. You can have um, a woman that has gotten to 55, 60 years old. She achieved all she wanted to, was here. She was married, good, bad, and different. Now she's in a new era. The world is opened up. I can do new things. I can go here. I can do yeah. that. <laughs> and many times on the opposite side of that, when men are 55, 60, they've broken their back for 50 years. And now they feel I'm done and I want to sit. And so sometimes those two energies have trouble finding each other because you have a whole group of women that are like, let's go explore everything. <laughs> also because after menopause, you have a reduction of estrogen which means that your testosterone, which gives you energy and excitement is much higher, which makes a lot of women want to get out there more. Interesting. And men, okay. our testosterone drops yeah. as we get older. So we, so. And that's why there's cougars in the world. The women look for the that is, I mean, And that energy level, that, that, that hits, you know, the, sometimes. The so, oh, um, God, God bless the cougars. Um, I, I was younger five. once. I was my mom younger. was 25 and she met my stepdad who was 30 and they were a perfect match. They oh, were yeah. 
I love when I was younger, I loved meeting women that were just out of uh, uh, long relationships because they saw the world in a completely different way. They, they wanted to experience everything that they haven't experienced. They wanted to try things they hadn't tried. They want to go places they haven't went. And I, that was great with my energy level now. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, now when it comes to um, being older, a challenge is that so many people have seen what they don't want yeah. as if they come in with a very narrow, specific thing of what they're looking for. I'm going to go back to what you said in the beginning. If we can just, I think the moral of this story of this episode is go out and have fun. Yes. As much as you can help the client analyze and be much more educated, which is so needed. But with all of that, don't forget to have fun fun because you may get overwhelmed with the knowledge of it but and if you don't want to just go have fun and just not know you know like i just love what you just taught us you have that knowledge that wisdom but have fun with it yeah. when you're out there you're smart you're wise you know what to look for what not to look for you know questions to ask and you're just so much more well equipped that you can just let go and have fun. You're, you're going into one of the phrases i teach my clients luck favors the prepared mind Ooh, I like that. The Very more good. that we are out there, the more luck is going to have a better chance of finding us. The more that we are prepared, the more that we've done the inner work, the more self-assured we are in our own skin, the, the easier it is for luck or chemistry to find us. Say the sentence, say the tagline again. I love it. Sure. Luck favors the prepared mind. And that goes with business too. It's it, across the board. It's across that. the board. It's if the more prepared we all are, the more we're physically in play out of our house, the more we're telling others what our desires are, the much easier way for something lucky to present itself. Look at you and me in Clubhouse. I mean, Clubhouse in general, what it, what that particular bit of luck. And I think for all of us that translated it uh, Clubhouse well is all of us were movers. We were ready to go. We were ready to do things. We had we had done the work, and then yeah. Clubhouse presents itself this bit of luck, uh, and then we all ran with it and were able to connect with it because we had all done all of the prepared work for it. So true. Those of us who are you know, the real deals, doing what we really say we did, we all have made these connections, collaborations. We're all still here. You know, sometimes Clubhouse isn't. We're still here. So really good point. Well, I'm going to close with this, and and I still want to have you come back. I'd like for you to come back and be a regular. I don't love really you. have a lot of people come back regularly, but this is so important to find love because we we can teach them all day long how to earn more, live more, give back more. But if you if you want to find love and you're not finding it, or you're lonely and you don't want to be, you're not happy where you are, and somebody like you could come along and help them. I think that's so important. And and the the biggest predictor of your future earnings is your marital status. Why, what do you mean? People that are married earn more. Really? If you're just looking specifically at earnings, the statistic that is tied the most to earnings is your marital status. Is that because they're a team and they because can- Because they're a team, more settled, the, yeah, the taxes, um, you have someone to support you, you have, like, if you need to, a day off, someone can cover for you, things like that as well. So your success, know. so much of your success, a success in person is predicated on who you are with. So it's an important decision to get right. It really is. And I trust your judgment because you are such a fanatical uh, uh, or you have such a fanatical thirst for knowledge. So you don't just don't spit things out there. That's a really good statistic to know. All right. So it all goes hand in hand. Hans, I'm going to ask you the very last question in 60 seconds or less, or I'll give you 85 seconds. <laughs> what is your legacy? How do you most want to be remembered when this life is done? As I said, my, my tagline is changing the world one smile at a time. And I think that especially for people that are born into any sort of a privilege, the least that we can do is leverage what we have to help others. And I feel that every single person uh, in this world wants to have better connections with other people in this world. One aspect of it is romantic, yes, but most of what I teach is 80% of it's just how to be a better human being, how to better have human connections, how to learn and grow around other humans, because I want to just leave this world a tiny bit better than I found it. And now having my daughters with me and being able to teach them communication skills and being able to, fortunately or unfortunately, be the first template of a man that they ever know, the pressure's on me to make sure that I, I set the stage for both them 
and so that then they can help society as well too. And hopefully we can all get to a better place. Thank you, Hunt, so much. And I just noticed that sign behind you. <laughs> it's like, awesome, Araya. You're so cute. <laughs> what does that say? <laughs> You're awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Until next time, everybody, this is Get Celebritized, and we hope we inspired you today to live your best life. Thank you, Hunt. See you next time. Bye-bye.